Greece joined World War I late as the conflict was all but decided, missing out on excellent deals from Britain for Cyprus and Western Anatolia. After entering in 1917, they fought valiantly to retake their historic lands and reform the Byzantine Empire, a plan known as the Magali Idea. Despite winning the Great War and getting all this from the Treaty of Sevres in 1920, the Hellenes lost the Greco-Turkish War, lasting from 1919 to 1922, and sadly failed to revive the Roman Empire. But don't get down, you have over 18,000 Byzantines and the 90% who haven't subscribed yet. History is forever changed in July 1914 as the Great War broke out. King Constantine, who favored Germany and wanted to remain neutral, similar to King Ferdinand in Romania, anticipated the conflict would arrive in Greece and secretly began preparing the army for conflict. In August, while inspecting the military with his son, Prince George, the two were blown up in their vehicle by Turks, leaving the 21-year-old Alexander as king. Alexander was popular both at home and abroad, and was ambivalent towards the Entente and the Central Powers, but was a staunch supporter of Elefarios Venizelos, the pro-Entente Prime Minister. In January 1915, the British offered Alexander massive Anatolian lands if he would enter and defend Serbia, but he would have to cede Macedonia to Bulgaria. This offer was rejected. A few months later, in the midst of the Gallipoli Campaign, on October 16, 1915, Britain still asked Greece to join the conflict, offering Cyprus as well, but made no guarantees on Constantinople. With the army in a far better position, the Greeks entered the war against Bulgaria in November. The Bulgars sent their army south to Macedonia and east to Serbia to join the Austro-Hungarians, believing the Serbs and Greeks would quickly collapse. This proved incorrect, and the failure to quickly and decisively end the conflict caused massive morale issues and led to political instability at home. The strengthened Greek army drove them back after a few weeks, seizing western Bulgaria, threatening Sofia, before the fighting slowed and continued. The British had been fighting in the Gallipoli Campaign since February 1915, and the Greek reinforcements were much needed when they arrived in December. Their forces were pinned down at the beachhead on the Bosphorus, so the Hellenes sent transports on the Aegean, opening a new front for the Ottomans, resulting in victorious battles for the Greeks. Eventually, the Ottomans in Thrace were encircled and eliminated by March 1916, as Ataturk died. Within a few weeks of the successful campaign, the Bulgars dropped out of the war as things became increasingly unstable at home as the Greeks pushed into eastern Rumelia, ceding ethnic Greek lands and dropping their claim to Macedonia and Thrace. This left Greece with complete control of the western Aegean. The Tsar's popularity crashed, but the government did not collapse, similar to the Second Balkan War. The main body of Greek troops were now free to push east and retook Adrianople. Upon the victory, the army immediately pushed east to Constantinople without notifying the British, similar to how they acquired Thessalonica in the Second Balkan War. When they reached the Queen of Cities, they entered in for a long siege. The British elected to focus on saving Serbia rather than besieging Constantinople. By May, Churchill's British expeditionary forces reached Serbia as it continued to fight alongside some small Greek reinforcements, forcing Austria to focus on the Balkans. The front quickly developed into the same type of trench warfare present in the Western Front, quickly bogging to a halt. Romania then joined the war, opening another front for Austria, but their army was extremely weak and ineffective. The rest of the Greek army did not join the siege at Constantinople, instead focusing on cutting supplies, preparing for the next major campaign, Smyrna, landing in September, further stretching the Ottomans thin. The Hellenes made further landings in Anatolia at Aveli and Phokea, as the Smyrna campaign evolved into the Ionian Front, with the Greeks consolidating control in the mountainous region. The first push was south to stabilize the front at the Meander River. After securing the north side of the river, they moved north to choke out Constantinople. The United States entered the war on April 2nd, spelling the inevitable collapse of the Central Powers, while Russia began to collapse. But the Romanovs had more time to flee as the situation was not as bad as Austria never focused on the east. Instead of seeking asylum from the British, who refused them, the Romanovs fled south to their Orthodox brethren in Greece. By October, the Greeks controlled both sides of the Dardanelles before the Ionian army captured Bursa, one of the major Ottoman cities. The Armenians and Hellenes within the city sabotaged the Ottomans and welcomed the Greeks as liberators, with few Turks surviving. They quickly moved north and besieged Nicomedia, the last holdout before Constantinople. In January, the Greeks pushed east to take Magnesia. They also retook the city of Philadelphia on the 18th, the last mainland Anatolian city of the Eastern Romans that was lost to the Ottomans in 1390. Magnesia fell in February after a relatively quick battle. 
At the same time, Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan all declared independence from Russia. Nicomedia fell in March, cutting off all supply lines to Constantinople. The siege of Constantinople had been ongoing for over a year in Thrace, but the lack of supplies was a death blow to the defenders. Orthodox priests reminded the soldiers that the Angels of Heaven, alongside the souls of Constantine, Justinian, Heraclius, and Basil II, were watching from above, and aiding them. The Golden Gate of Constantinople fell in vain, signaling the end of the siege. Fulfilling the ancient prophecies, the marble body of Constantine XI, the last Roman emperor, was discovered when a great ox heralded the oncoming Greek army. The city was mercilessly bombarded, with the Turks inside running out of men and supplies as the morale plummeted while the Hellenes were on the verge of retaking their most precious possession. The Patriarch and many Greek soldiers claimed Constantine came to life and aided with the siege before going up to heaven. On May 29th, exactly 465 years since the Ottomans stole the city, the Hellenes triumphantly re-entered, liberating it from the Turkish occupiers. The Greeks and Armenians inside rejoiced with all the Byzantine prophecies coming true as the Pashas, alongside the Caliph, were slain. In the east, Armenia invaded the Ottomans, eager to retake their historic lands and repay the Turks for the atrocities they had committed against them throughout the war and the previous centuries. The Treaty of Saint-Germain was signed on September 10, 1919, officially dissolving Austria, but Serbia pushed deep into Hungary, eager for revenge. Hungary refused to back down until eventually agreeing to the Treaty of Trianon on June 4, 1920, establishing the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, better known as Yugoslavia. Greece and Yugoslavia partitioned Albania between themselves. In Anatolia, the Hellenes pushed on, but the Ottomans were in complete collapse, signing the Treaty of Sevra on August 10, 1920. In recognition for the major contributions against the Ottomans, Greece gained Eastern Thrace, Bithynia, Ionia, Aeolia, and Cyprus as previously agreed with by the UK. The British tried to force the Hellenes to turn Constantinople into an international zone, but France and the US rejected the British proposal and the Greeks refused to even contend it. Eventually, the British were given a military port in the Sea of Marmara, similar to Gibraltar, alongside trade agreements through the Straits. In return, the British returned the ancient Hellenic sculptures from the Parthenon and the Acropolis stolen by Thomas Bruce between 1812 and 1816, greatly increasing Alexander's popularity. After heavy financial incentives, Italy renounced the Dodecanese, returning Rhodes to Greece for recognition and support of their Anatolian claims in Lycia. Despite these treaties, the Greco-Turkish War had been raging since May 1919. The Young Turks cooed the Ottoman remnants and declared war upon Greece and Armenia. However, without Ataturk, they were led by Topal Osman, who kicked off the war by taking Lycia from the Italians. Eventually, the Italians gave up on their Anatolian dreams and exited the war shamefully. The Greeks achieved a major victory at the Battle of Tabassium, completely destroying the birthplace of the Ottomans. Another Turkish army was decimated by a combined Armenian-Assyrian one at Manzikert, causing massive celebrations throughout Greece. Without Ataturk, the Young Turks' government was trounced in battle after battle, forcing them to eliminate Pontic Hellenes in revenge, just as they had done with the Armenians and Assyrians, who were able to secure their statehood as they resisted the Turks and kept the Soviets out. Eventually, the Greeks took Ankara and crushed the Young Turks, forcing them to the negotiating table at the Treaty of Lausanne, solidifying the Sykes-Picot Agreement from 1916. France solidified its previously agreed-upon Anatolian holdings from 1916, while Hellas took Doris, Lycia, and Pontus from the Turks, with Pontus being similar to East Prussia for Germany. Armenia was greatly increased, pushing into Anatolia, receiving the lands originally given to Russia in the Sykes-Picot Agreement. A small Assyrian state, as well as a Kurdish state, were also established as French protectorates. Ironically, the Greeks reinstated the Ottomans as a mere rump state, who recognized Hellenic control over Constantinople. The Ottomans mirrored Hungary, ruled by a regent, Mustafa Sabri, a staunch critic of the Young Turks, and had no sultan. Focusing on Hellas, Patriarch Basil III declared Constantine XI the saint, as Greece built a massive 300-foot-tall marble statue of the so-called Marble Emperor in Constantinople, being viewed as the new Colossus of Rhodes for the Greeks and the Orthodox faith. Restoration began on the Hagia Sophia, which was converted back into an Orthodox cathedral. The blasphemous minarets were torn down and a massive cross was put on the dome of the church. New marble work and mosaics also began. Greece kept strict adherence to state orthodoxy as religion became the determinant for your identity. 
All Orthodox were considered Greeks, while Muslims were considered Turks. This increased religious fervor, and Greece never became a democracy. The autocephalous Church of Greece, that had been forcibly split from Constantinople in 1833, led by Athens, was folded back under the ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople. The autocephalous Church of Cyprus was not, however, as it is recognized as the first Greek Orthodox autocephalous Church, being formed in 431 under the reign of Emperor Theodosius II. Politics were quite stable, as Alexander and Venizelos were popular and loved. The white immigres, remnant of the white movements in Russia, were welcomed in and given land in the depopulated areas of eastern Thrace. Instead of viewing themselves as the successors of the classical Greeks, they heavily drew upon their Byzantine forefathers. The upper house of parliament was renamed the Senate, comprising the military, the Phanariots, and the landed nobility. In 1928, the Hagia Sophia restoration was finished. The first actions inside the cathedral was the coronation of Alexander as the new Roman Emperor, Alexander II, the Restorer. The nation changed its name from the Kingdom of Greece to the Emperor of Romania. They were known as Byzantium in the West, just as they were previously known as Greece instead of Hellas. Alexander changed his family name from Glücksburg to Constantino to sound more Hellenic, claiming a lineage from Constantine the Great. This mirrored the British royals changing from Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha to Windsor. Alexander's son, Basil III, was also christened inside the Hagia Sophia, signaling Bulgarian ambitions held by the Byzantines. This was immensely popular at home, but controversial abroad. Bulgaria, the Ottomans, and Italy were all irate. Mussolini was livid, dreaming of restoring Rome himself, cutting ties between the two nations and refusing to recognize the transition. France was excited as Byzantium and Armenia joined the Little Entente, which had developed far beyond the anti-Hungarian faction it started as. Romania and Yugoslavia, other members and fellow Orthodox nations were also pleased by the news. The Byzantine military rapidly modernized and improved due to the White Russians, overhauling the armed forces into the best in the Mediterranean, weakening Italy's position. Their economy also followed suit, becoming slightly larger than the Italians due to their strategic position. Following the death of Venizelos in 1936, Alexander took more power as subsequent prime ministers became puppets to the emperor. As tensions rose throughout Europe, Byzantium, Yugoslavia, and Romania signed a secret treaty to partition Bulgaria as all three ramped up their militaries. The Second World War kicked off in 1939, with the Byzantines stay neutral but drastically increasing their army, almost rivaling that of France. They sent some of their army to aid Yugoslavia, cracking down on the Croatian nationalists, giving the Yugoslavs time to strengthen. On August 30, 1940, Germany tried to force Romania and Yugoslavia to surrender land to Hungary and Bulgaria, but backed by Byzantium, they refused. A few days later, on September 6, Carol II was forced to abdicate the Romanian throne, with the Byzantines strongly supporting the young and popular King Michael I, helping him overthrow the German-backed government of Antonescu. All these actions enraged the Germans, Italians, and Bulgarians, who prepared for war and invaded Yugoslavia in October. Would Byzantium emerge victorious in the Second World War, or would the Axis prove too much? 8,000 likes for a part 2. If you liked what you saw, like, share, and subscribe. Comment any ideas you guys have for future videos, and if you want the maps and more, check out my Patreon or become a channel member. If you liked this video, I know you're going to love seeing my German victory in World War 1. Goodbye.